future spouses have some pretty clear protections. Hey, I am Chuck the bureaucrat, and I like to think that I am fearless. Like, I will wade into the bureaucratic swamp and hack away tirelessly at the red tape. But I think I might have met my match with the Former Spouse Protection Act. The origin story of this piece of legislation goes back to 1981, when there was a, a landmark case, McCarty versus McCarty, that went all the way to the Supreme Court. And the question was whether or not military retired pay could be treated as marital property. The Supreme Court did not actually take any action. They kicked it back saying that legislative action was required by Congress to answer this question. And so in 1982, Congress passed a law. This is commonly referred to as the Uniformed Services Former Spouse Protection Act, and over the years it's been codified and, and refined. Now, before we go any further, let me be very clear. I am not a divorce attorney. In fact, the mere mention of the word divorce upsets my household to such a degree that, quite frankly, I haven't put much brain power into it. And this Former Spouse Protection Act it comes with a lot of subtle nuances. I'm going to talk about some of the basics, but if you need professional help, you're going to have to go further. The one thing I will offer is that the contents of this video should serve as a litmus test for any divorce attorney you are considering hiring. If they don't know that the act exists or how a DRO plays into it or how to calculate disposable retired pay or how to elect between spouse and former spouse, well, the truth of the matter is they might do you more harm than good. Okay, first things first, the Former Spouse Protection Act does not set automatic entitlement rules for dividing military retired pay. It doesn't compel the courts to do anything. What it does is it gives the appropriate courts the ability to treat retired pay as marital property. And it authorizes DFAS to make payments directly to the former spouse in certain circumstances. This seems to be a very important nuance. The way that the law protects the former spouse is not by setting an amount, but once the courts have determined an amount, DFAS will pay the money directly to the former spouse. The money does not go to the retired service member who then pays the former spouse. All right, within the scope of our discussion today, we're really going to focus on two major benefits, and that is the retired pay that comes with a pension and the survivor benefit program. First, let's talk about the retired pay. And here you have two important limitations, a 10 by 10 rule and a 50% rule. Before we get too far, remember, these are not limits on what the court can order. These are limits on what DFAS can pay directly to the former spouse. Okay, under the 10 by 10 rule, DFAS will only make payments to the former spouse if the couple was married for 10 years and while they were married, the service member had at least 10 years of military service. So let's look at three cases. In each example, the state court can direct the military retired pay be divided, but only in case three, where there's 10 years of overlap, will DFAS make payments directly to the former spouse. The second rule, which I call the 50% rule, is that DFAS will only make direct payments to the former spouse up to 50% of the disposable retired pay. This concept of disposable retired pay is the remainder of total retired pay after subtracting out overpayments or recoupment, fines due to court martial, amounts waived to get a VA compensation, survivor benefit premiums that support the former spouse, and retired pay from a medical retirement. DFAS will only directly pay the former spouse 50% of the remainder, that green portion, and I'm going to keep foot stomping this point. But for a moment, I want you to imagine a situation where a married military couple gets divorced, the court 
assigns a certain portion of the service member's retired pay to the former spouse. But then, before the service member actually retires, they do something colossally boneheaded. They get themselves court-martialed, and they get some kind of fine that basically wipes out their pension. It doesn't eliminate the former spouse's right to the court-ordered value of the communal property, the pension. It just eliminates DFAS's obligation to directly pay the former spouse. And the same thing can happen with the VA waiver. If a service member has a VA disability rating between 10 and 40 percent, whatever the VA pays that retired service member is deducted from their DOD pension. That doesn't necessarily change the service member's obligations to their former spouse, it just changes DFAS's obligations. And this whole issue of the limits by which DFAS will directly compensate a former spouse is why you need a divorce attorney who understands these laws. There are ways to write a court order so that changes in a service member's disposable retired pay doesn't completely upset the apple cart. Apparently, it's something called a domestic relations order or a DRO. I don't know the details, but I'm telling you, if your attorney doesn't know the details, <laughs> Before we wrap up this discussion of retired pay, there are a couple of fine points that I want to hit. That 10 by 10 rule, it only applies to military retired pay. It doesn't apply to things like alimony or child support. Number two, only the former spouse or their attorney can request direct pay from DFAS, not the service member. Number three, Setting up a direct payment to a former spouse takes DFAS about 90 days, which is longer than it normally takes when they set up a new retiree account. So if you are divorced, you can kind of expect the first couple of months of retirement are going to be a little more rocky than they would be otherwise. And number four, the marital status of the former spouse doesn't have any bearing on these payments. I mean, there's other benefits where marital status matters, but not here. Okay, the next thing we're going to talk about is Survivor Benefit Program, and I'm not going to give you the whole razzmatazz about this program because I've got a whole bunch of other videos that get into those details. Instead, I want to focus on three rules from the Former Spouse Protection Act that can cause some complications. Number one, courts can order a service member to provide survivor benefit coverage for a former spouse, but only if that former spouse was already receiving coverage as a current spouse. The way I understand this is that if, while the couple was married, the spouse agreed to opt out of the survivor benefit program, then once they divorce, the court can't order the service member to provide coverage for the now former spouse. Number two, remarriage matters for survivor benefit coverage former spouse remarries before age 55, three things happen. Eligibility for survivor benefit is lost, coverage is suspended, and costs are not owed. But here's the weird part. If the former spouse's new marriage ends, eligibility is restored, coverage begins again, and so do the costs. Remember when I said that this whole act made me feel like I was in a little over my head. See, I don't know what happens during this hiatus. I mean, does the, the service member's current spouse then become eligible for survivor benefit? Or what happens to the disposable retired pay calculation during this period? I mean, it is some deep, confusing stuff, and I, I don't have all the answers. But I will tell you that I found this third rule downright terrifying. You see, survivor benefit coverage is not based on the individual. It's based on the relationship to the service member. If a person transitions from a current spouse status to a former spouse status and nobody ever tells DFAS, well, Uncle Sam will happily collect payments and provide no coverage. What's more, DFAS requires written notification of the change. You give them the court order, 
that it's not good enough. They want more. You want to get angrier about this? The former spouse has one year from the date of the divorce to do this themselves. If they wait past one year, then it has to be done by the service member. So I am serious. If you find yourself anywhere near this kind of a situation, you want to find an experienced guide. Because me, I am not going back into that rat hole if I can avoid it. Nah, seriously, man, it is scary down there. I say it's just cheaper to keep her.